Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Glenn Messenger. I lead the security team for GKE, and I'm going to give a very, very brief rundown on security when we think about GKE. Um, it's probably going to go for about 15 minutes. I'm really going to try and keep it to that. Otherwise, uh, violence might ensue. But please, if there's any questions, let me know. So I think this goes without saying. It's an exciting time for, for digital innovation right now. There's a lot of momentum happening in the market. You would have all seen this, especially with AI and other things happening. The past few years has been a challenge on how you can really position what we're trying to do and our customers are trying to do to satisfy the market. And balancing the need for innovation and transformation and security risk is always very difficult. You know, usually one does not beget the other. And security on Kubernetes does require a shift in focus. Now, Kubernetes, I think we can all agree, is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly flexible. That's one of the main reasons it's survived for 10 years and gone to where it is. But Power and flexibility usually leads to complexity. And that's why we see security is usually the top barrier to entry when it comes to using Kubernetes. And the majority of people that do use Kubernetes have had security incidents. Either they've had a compromise that has actually hit them in production, or they've had a compromise that stopped them from rolling out to production. So with GKE Security, we really try and enable our customers to innovate, and we focus on three core areas. We try and reduce risk, and this is an obvious one. But this is something that we want to do with our partners. You've probably heard of shared responsibility or shared fate model that Google uses. If we can lower the risk factor and lower the, the risk for our customers in total, it's a net win. We try and enhance security. Compliance, whether it's regulatory compliance or industry best practice, is incredibly hard. We can help our customers do that, or if they can inherit it, it's even better. And the third one is operational efficiency. We've heard this from a lot of our customers. Throwing tools at a solution does not equal a solution. It actually makes it harder. So we're really trying to simplify the operating model when it comes to GKE. So I just drew this yesterday. I just drew it for this talk. This is typically how we think of runtime security. Now there's a lot I haven't put up on here. I haven't put supply chain security by, by intention. I haven't put data security, operations, automated response. I really want us to zoom in for these particular sections on today's, for today's audience. So starting at the bottom, we typically think of platform security like patching and supply chain. Before you even put a workload on GKE, we patch it to the nth degree. So we adhere to FedRAMP higher, for example. We now rot out SBOMs, as I'm sure most people in the market have done. And we take our supply chain seriously. We also do a high degree of hardening and compliance. As you can probably guess, the amount of work Google does with Kubernetes open source is significant. So when there's these annoying things like the read-only port that existed for five years in Kubernetes, these are the sort of things that we try and take with hardening and compliance. And identity and access. Identity is difficult. Kubernetes is its own ecosystem, so we're really trying to flatten that. You can bring your own identities with OIDC, or you can use IAM. But for today, I really want to zoom into the top section. I want to talk about KSPM for a few minutes, if we can. And I presume most people know what KSPM is, but it is really a set of tools and practices specific for Kubernetes to automate security and compliance. Now, KSVM or Kubernetes Security Posture Management is similar to Cloud Security Posture Management, which I presume most people have heard. CSVMs deal with enterprises' entire cloud footprint, whereas a KSVM is specific for Kubernetes. We're trying to give our users on GK a KSVM specific view while also in coordination with Security Command Center, which you've probably heard of, Chronicle, and Mandiant. So again, I really want to zoom in on this KSVM section, if we can. When we think of the KSPM section, we typically break it down into three areas that we've heard from customers that are the highest issues. Firstly is vulnerability management. And this isn't vulnerability in the supply chain. That's a fairly mature market. But vulnerability in the runtime, because the runtime doesn't always equal the supply chain. If I push up workloads, no matter what my CICD pipeline is, what are my vulnerabilities? Threat detection, what is the nefarious behavior, whether it's logs or system calls, for example? And compliance and governance is a very difficult problem. I worked for a bank for about 17 years, and I don't think I went an hour without having a compliance problem. And this is the same problem for our customers as well. So let's jump in. I want to talk about vulnerability quickly. We launched GKE Security Posture, which is a vulnerability detection tool, I think about nine months ago, where literally, if you push up a workload to one cluster, 100,000 clusters, it doesn't matter how many it is, and if you push up a million workloads, we do runtime-based vulnerability detection on the cluster. We extract the image, we look for container OS vulnerabilities, but we also do language packs because the vast majority of our customers, their business logic is in Go, Golang, Java, JavaScript, or Python. So we can actually do that no matter how you got those workloads to the cluster. We typically do it in about 15 seconds. What we don't do is look at the data that's on the container, just the layers of the container. And we use, I think it's 
six or eight CV sources, eight different sources. So we don't just rely on our own internal intelligence. We actually get this intelligence from everywhere. So we can give you true signals. And then we use CVSS V3. Now, once we've got all this, we want to present it to customers in an easy way. Hopefully this is coming across okay, but we can show that we really try to break it down for customers. They told us they didn't want a list of vulnerabilities. That's just too much noise. So now a customer can really filter on severity, whether it's a vulnerability, the region, the cluster, the node, the workload, and they can go down the details to see all the CVSS info. And they can see where that vulnerability is impacting all their workloads. This is a demo environment I've done, and we can see that BusyBot and Alpine, there's probably not the best demo because there's quite a lot, but you can see now I can break it down into ad service, and I can look at the specific vulnerabilities for the workloads I care about. Now I'm going to talk about threats. I think we're good for time still. But can I ask one quick question on the vulnerability management? Yes. Are you doing any automated remediation, or are you asking the deploy the, the runner of the system instances to do the... It's a great, great question. So we've had customer feedback. They are willing to entertain you automation of remediation at the OS layer, but mm -hmm. not the business logic, because okay. we really don't have enough information. There's also a concern if we did do the business logic because the cluster is not the source of truth, the supply chain is. So we're looking at whether customers have a tolerance for us to do the OS container. At the moment, it's the visibility and insight that they're after. So it's a long way of me saying no, but we really want to respond to the market there carefully. Yeah. yeah. Is there a mechanism where we can also filter these vulnerabilities where we've got an external remediation for the vulnerability? Yeah, so this is one thing I should bring up. We only surface vulnerabilities when there is a fix available. If they're not actionable, we don't surface them at the moment. That's going to change in a couple of months where you can toggle it. But again, a lot of our customers said it's too much noise. So we actually give them a bit to flip where they can say, only show me things I can fix versus show me everything. Because some customers want to see everything. So we're going to have both shortly. What about the ability to flag it if it's a like we get to these accept risk because it's a known vulnerability and we can't upgrade it because yeah. it's or we've got an external mitigation that the developer wants. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be muting, for example. So you can say in these situations, it's a known risk. My risk department has said this is okay. We're going to be introducing that fairly soon. You cannot at the moment, but that's going to be coming soon where you can filter on namespace, workload, or cluster in itself. I'm going to talk about threat very briefly. So in April this year, we went to Las Vegas to Cloud Next, and we launched GKE Threat Detection. And threat detection is really two things. What we launched was our log detection capabilities. So there's ETD, Event Threat Detection, as a part of GCP, which is an incredibly powerful data pipeline. You cannot imagine the amount of data that we go through, and we have this fantastic pipeline that we've tapped into, where we really look for privilege escalations, defense evasion, and a few other things specific for GKE. And we already have uh, behavior-based KTD detection, which uses EPBF to look for system calls. So we launched threat detection, and we launched it. Uh, we launched it with uh, several detections. I should put up there. These are the ones that we launched in April. I won't go into them too in depth, but again, we wanted to have a very similar service where a customer should be able to say, "I care about threat. I care about it on this particular cluster. Show me all the threats in this area." So what we did was. Again, we give details on threat. We give details on how you can remediate the threat, as well as where that threat is being seen everywhere else. So again, here's a privilege escalation. Someone did a cluster binding on this cluster. It's only medium, so they didn't bind it to anonymous or anything. I can see how to remediate it. I can link over to MITRE as well. And I can see who did it and when. And from here, I can go straight to the logs, or I can go straight to SCC, Security Command Center. Same threat, links for you. And now you get the expanded view. So now you can see that threat in the context of all of GCP. SCC is fantastic at giving you that cross-product uh, calibration there. So now we can see all the details here. It's been JSONified. It makes it a lot easier and palatable depending on who's looking at the data. And uh, finally, compliance and governance. I put these two things together, not to be confusing, but typically they're used in the same way. A lot of our customers said, I care about an industry standard. I want to know what my delta is. We've also had a lot of customers that say, I care about governance. I want to set guardrails to stop people from doing certain things. So we launched GKE Compliance in April at Cloud Next again with the ability for it to be a black box. Customers simply wanted to say, I care about CIS benchmark or I care about pod security standards. Tell me how I'm comparing to that. So what we did was launched GKE Compliance, which is this dashboard that shows a general overview of what your status is. 
And you can drill down to an industry specific standard, like here I've done CIS benchmark 1.5 on that same cluster, and I can see at the control level what my percentage is. It makes it a lot easier for a customer to try and determine what that is. Here I can see identity 5.2, 5.21, there's something wrong there, I'm using the default service account. Here it tells me exactly what I need to do to remediate that, and it shows me the clusters that have the same problem. The end goal is for customers to not have to build their own policies to determine compliance, but if we can do it ourselves. As a fast follow, there's going to be reporting and exporting of this data as well, because that's never done in isolation for compliance. And we're also going to be expanding out the benchmarks in here. For example, we already have policy controller, for those that are aware. We really can customize it. We use OPA Gatekeeper in the back end. Here we've got 80 policies and 14 bundles. Here we're filtering on the NSA hardening guide, for those that are familiar with that. We can actually see the specific problem that it's highlighted here on the specific cluster. And this is using, again, open source industry standards for us to do this. Um, and we've been doing this for a while. This didn't come out recently. Policy control has been out for a couple of years. See, I've got one minute left, which I think is pretty good, because um, this is the end. I only had a 15 minute slot. I really wanted to keep it quick. Again. Um, you're, not, you're not doing anything from a storage perspective to check to see that you know certain admins are going out deleting all these files or encrypting files or anything like that? Or... On the cluster itself? Yes. Uh, we're doing some things on the cluster. So you might have heard of confidential hyperdisk first that just encrypts the data using customer control keys for CMEC and it does it at scale. We don't do DLP within GKE itself, but we put a DLP fence around GKE. So DLP is data leak protection. I mean, I, I'm talking more about somebody go in and encrypt all my data and say, you know, give me a billion dollars and I'll decrypt it for you. Okay. Uh, we have protections for that, probably from an RBAC perspective, where we try and do least privilege and restrict who's got access to that. Um, it's typically a stateless workloads that we see on the cluster themselves, and RBAC's the typical answer. We also do IDP as well, which can constrain how people can administer the clusters, but that's an indirect answer to your question, I feel like. 